This is a kind of an atypical talk, and I tried to find sort of niche space that wasn't already covered and so profoundly depressing. Um, that uh, so apocalypses are in the news. This is kind of um, uh, puzzling in that. It, it's a, a biblical term. It, it's from the Greek Revelation, the book of Daniel, who was a prophet saved by God from his enemies, who had a vision that Israel would similarly be saved from its enemies at the uh, end of days. Uh, so it arose in a biblical context, uh, and it also exists in a fictional context. The ap apocalyptic fiction imagines a sudden catastrophic event that causes the collapse of civilization. Causes can be natural and out of human control, as in Hot House, written in 1962, where the Earth gets locked in orbit, constantly facing the sun, and plants over photosynthesize and basically fill all other organism niches. Or it can be out of uh, human and the result of evil and greed, as it is when in the blight, when powerful international organization aimed at world domination kills off all the trees. Uh, to my knowledge, there's only one ap apocalyptic insect uh, uh, novel that's by Charles Pellegrino, written in 1998, uh, called Dust. And all insects disappear because of a supposedly well-known intermittent cyclical extinction event every 33 million years. Sort of a cheat because Yes, all the insects go extinct, but all the mites evolve to fill their niches. So there's still arthropod domination. By the way, this is going to be made into a movie, coming to a theater new year soon. Now, we now face a real insect apocalypse, or do we? If you do a Google search, it's not all that clear. The insect apocalypse is here in the New York Times, as Brooke Jarvis can attest. Um, uh, or maybe uh, um, it's not really here. Or maybe it's here, and uh, bug scientists and the a uh, tiresome way that uh, often journalists uh, like to find uh, insect puns. Uh, bug scientists squash the apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic scenarios. Uh, so I, I got interested in, I, I know we're concerned as scientists, but what does the public think of all this? And there's no, I know how to evaluate what scientists think, but how do you get to what the public is thinking? And here's where I use a completely untested and unverified un, uh, uh, method, uh, for want of a better one, is to use Google Trends, which is a website by Google that, as you see, analyzes the popularity of top search queries in Google search across regions and languages, uses graphs to compare the search volume of different queries, and numbers represent search interest relative to the highest point in the chart for that time uh, and region and a value of 100 is the peak popularity. Okay, so um, searching insect apocalypse uh, on Google Trends, I was not surprised to see this uh, peak arise in uh, December 2018, a month after the New York Times mag uh, um, article came out. But I was surprised to see we went through an earlier one in 2004. Uh, this was actually occasioned by the emergence of the uh, brood 10 uh, periodical cicadas, which apparently unsettled some people. Um, in the New York Times article, Welcome to Cicadaville, Enter at Your Own Risk. Bepocalypse, however, uh, was coined in June 2007. Uh, and uh, it, that co is coincidence with the appearance of colony collapse disorder, the mysterious phenomenon that affected honeybees, uh, uh, whereby um, foragers would leave their queen, uh, queen and, and uh, grubs behind with, and uh, no bodies could be found. So that was reached 35 states by 2007. And you can see the apocalypse is fairly uh, stable in, uh, in its reappearances on, on Google Trends blinded by the light here. Now, in the scientific literature, although concerns were raised much earlier, the phrase pollinator decline first appeared in a web of science search topic uh, in 1991 as a title word in 2000. This is the paper from 2000, uh, the risk of pollinator decline in global pollinator, pollinator initiative. So it's a risk. It's from a conference proceedings, the Asian International Pollination Symposium. However, by 2018, this pollinator decline title was an ecological calamity in the making. So uh, in uh, 2005, the National Academy of Sciences or the National Research Council, the research arm of the NAS, uh, 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 convened a committee uh, uh, and charged them with evaluating pollinator uh, 
decline. I was uh, asked to chair that committee. And the first thing that the committee did uh, in reading its charge was to change the name of the committee to not decline of pollinators, but the status of pollinators, because National Research Council studies are supposed to be unbiased, even-handed, and draw their conclusions based on data. And to call it decline uh, would presuppose there was a, an actual decline. So after 18 months, uh, we released the report findings, 2006. Are pollinators in decline? Well, there's a long-term population trends for honeybees are demonstrably downward, but similar data we conclude are, not are available for a few other pollinators. Uh, in, uh, despite the paucity of long-term data, collectively there's a, uh, reliable evidence that some North American pollinator species have become extinct or exhibited decreases in population sizes, including uh, two bumblebee species that face imminent extinction. Uh, in terms of causes for managed pollinators, introduced parasites and pathogens were implicated. Uh, the causes of decline among wild pollinators were difficult to assign some known and potential causes. Pathogens that have spilled over from commercially produced uh, bumblebees for greenhouse pollination, and habitat degradation, and loss. Uh, in terms of whether this was a crisis, whether this is a pollinator crisis is difficult to ascertain in as much as there's no definition of crisis that's universally accepted. It's not a scientific term. But if decline is defined as a systematic decrease, then there is evidence that some pollinators in North America representing a diversity of taxa are in decline. That was 2006, and then ultimately the study was published in 2007. In terms of what to do, uh, effective conservation and restoration of pollinator populations requires comprehensive knowledge of their biology, which was insufficient. Public outreach is key, and one of the recommendations enhanced public awareness in the broader community. So how did that work out in the intervening uh, 13 or 12 uh, years? Oh, almost, well. Uh, so this is a, a search of Web of Science of pollinator decline. And you can see it begins back here in the 90s. This is the era of colony collapse disorder. And right now have eight, more than 1,800 papers that have pollinator decline as a topic. Um, and that these have accumulated over time almost 25,000 citations in terms of what is related to pollinator decline in these papers. If you do a search of pollinator and pesticides, that's 269 papers, pollinators and pathogen, 167. But pollinator and habitat, more than one third of the papers uh, cite those two uh, search terms. Uh, that's over a third. And we've heard a lot about the importance of habitat here. Uh, that's the scientific literature. What about the general public? So I did a, a Google Trends search on honeybee, and it made no sense to me. Um, there's no, 20, there's no uh, colony collapse disorder uh, 2006 or 7 signal. Uh, I understand why Montana is in the top five. It is the second largest honey producer in the nation. But, oh, sorry. What's West Virginia doing at the top? Um, it's a tiny state, not known for uh, its love of honeybees. And uh, when I looked further into related research terms, I discovered April 2011 is when Blake Shelton released his chart-topping hit, Honeybee. <laughs> and you can see um, that uh, actually in the honey-producing states here, not so much interest as there is in the uh, southern states of the US. Uh, I mention this because it's reflective of where insects rank among popular concerns in America. Okay, if you search on honeybee insect as a qualifier, then you see that 2007 signal, and you see cyclical interest, and it has been sustained through 2019. Beepocalypse as well, peaked in 2007, but it still keeps coming back, um, um, I guess zombie-like, <laughs> after uh, uh, whenever there's a literature uh, published that raises that concern again. Honeybee decline, again, has re remained uh, prominent in, uh, in U.S. searches. Now, monarch butterflies have long been a fascination to uh, entomologists. There are over 1,000 papers that have published, been published on monarchs uh, as a topic, beginning in the 1950s here in, in this search. Now, remember, this is uh, when the National Academy of Studies came out, Na sciences came out, 2006, we could not determine that there was a pattern of decline, just cyclical variation. Uh, and in fact, one thing we noted in the study was that uh, uh, in Art Shapiro's famous now 47-year survey, it took 13 years to see a, a trend toward decline and 23 years to find it to that, until that trend became significant. 
So we'll follow up on that. And in fact, if you do a search on monarch butterfly, you see a, a tendency, the, the cyclical variation that, that kind of maps onto the cyclical uh, variation, the population size of the owner, the size of the overwintering population in the Oyamel fir forest, uh, Michoacan, Mexico, where the monarchs all overwinter, at least from the eastern populations. Generally, interesting, interest is expressed across the United States. Monarch decline, again, uh, first peaked in 2004 uh, when, when uh, this is the beginning of Google um, uh, Trends, and is cyclical, uh, car, the first big peak corresponded to this uh, dramatic decline, not the largest decline, but it, it certainly kicked off a, um, a, a series of peaks that co correspond with seasonal uh, striking declines. Uh, and this is just, there's no real increase. Uh, you don't really see an increase in recent years, despite spectacular headlines, spectacularly incorrect headlines. This is one from uh, San Francisco Chron Chronicle, California's most famous butterfly nearing death spiral. There's a Western population. It's also been man monitored. Uh, it's overwintering populations in Pacific Grove and elsewhere in the, uh, on, the, on the Pacific coast. Uh, and uh, this uh, breathless article, uh, describes an alarming precipitous drop in the western monarch butterfly uh, population in California could spell doom for the species, a scenario that biologists say it could also plunge bug-eating birds and other species into similar death spirals. I don't know which biologist would say that because, uh, as most people know, uh, monarch butterflies uh, feed on toxic plants in the family uh, Asclepiaceae, Asclepiaceae and store their toxic cardinalides and as a consequence are toxic and emetic to many birds including, yes, that's a vomiting blue jay right there. Um, this is so well known that my husband who is a retired film professor said, even I know that. So and I'm a retired film professor. There is, interestingly, no halo effect. Although there is lingering concern or continuing concern about monarch butterflies, it doesn't extend to other butterfly species, nor does it extend to uh, moth decline. Speaking of halo effects, this is the angel moth. Uh, it's a bombycid species uh, uh, native to the US. It feeds on Fraxinus, the genus of ash, and ashes themselves are in uh, grave danger due to um, emerald ash, ash borers. So in fact, the angel moth might well be risk, in risk of decline if its host plant disappears, for all the reasons you've heard earlier. As for bumblebees, even in 2006, it was clear bumblebees were generally speaking at risk. In fact, by March 2017, the rusty patch bumblebee Bombus affinis officially was designated as an endangered species. Um, this is 2006 again, during colony collapse disorder, uh, and, and uh, where the early signal of, of Bombus uh, species um, uh, declines were evident. Uh, and continuing interest, there's now almost 600 papers on just bombus decline. At least six studies on just bumblebee declines based on museum specimens uh, were published in 2019, which unfortunately provide all kinds of opportunities for the media to make stale jokes about the buzz about bumblebees. Uh, if you do a search on bumblebees, again, surprising, no 2007 signal, which should be there, uh, no uh, 2018 or 19 signal, and again, what's West Virginia doing on this list? So, uh, uh, again, I looked at related topics, uh, and in fact, the entire country is uh, very interested in bumblebee transformers, not so much bumblebees. Uh, bumblebee decline as a search term does show that 2007 sig uh, signal uh, and is trending upward in 2019. So even bumblebees didn't make it onto US uh, post office stamps. Who, they issued a, a f pollinator forever stamp um, uh, in, in uh, 2017 and chose, quote, two of our continent's most iconic species to represent uh, all pollinators, one of which is not native, and one of which has really has biology that's not really representative of most Lepidopterans. But even these two icons aren't equally iconic. If you do a search uh, on, uh, again, Google Trends, comparing the two simultaneously, um, red is uh, honeybee, blue is monarch, um, and uh, the, overwhelmingly the searches favor uh, honeybees uh, over monarchs two to one. And I would ask Google Trends, please do not use red and blue for any maps of the US. I had almost had a heart attack looking at that. Biodiversity was a term coined in 1992, and uh, it's hard, that bio, well, not coined, but popularized by E.O. Wilson, uh, and uh, interest is held steady and is also trending upward um, throughout the US. 
and, and unfortunately, biodiversity crisis is not. Uh, in fact, the, the initial interest when the term was introduced seems to be damping out despite the uh, increased uh, uh, interest in apocalypses. And in fact, Google Trends suggest that over time, there's been steadier interest in apocalypses than in con pollinator conservation, given the absence of a conspicuous upsurge in uh, the latter. Uh, Save the Bees has been more successful in garnering public interest over time, definitely uh, increasing, and again, a general pattern throughout the United States, including West Virginia, I think. Five years, this is five years of Google Trends, suggest that insect extinction may be gaining some traction in the five most populous states. Uh, and this corresponds to the publication, well, it's uh, December 2017, a month after the New York Times Magazine article article appeared. Now, nearly 90% of Americans are willing to help save animals from extinction, but they don't know how to help, uh, nor are they well equipped to. This was uh, Wilson et al. in 2017 did a survey to determine the degree of, of support for bee conservation and the level of understanding in public support of cons uh, conservation. In response to survey questions, he discovered that uh, people interested in bee conservation um, underestimate the number of bee species in the U.S. by two orders of magnitude. Uh, there are at least 4,000 species, and the estimates were, all, not, vast majority were under 500, and some of them were on the order of 50 or 60. Moreover, given bees to identify, even people interested in bee conservation, well, 95% of them could recognize bumblebees and honeybees, but when you get down to mason bees, only, only a third of the people recognized that those were bees, uh, and, and only... Uh, just a few more um, uh, recognize a sweat bee as a bee. Fortunately, nobody mistook uh, the grasshopper for an insect. And the most knowledgeable people about insect decline are those who are already woke, so to speak. This was a study of public knowledge of monarchs and support for butterfly conservation, the finding of which was that membership in an environmental organization increased the likelihood that participants had prior knowledge of monarchs and cared about monarch conservation. So. People active in monarch conservation are the ones who already are active in conservation. So the vast majority of Americans were not reaching with these messages. So for most Americans, doing something to save pollinators might seem like a lot of work. Here on the internet, you can find three ways to boost pollination. Oops, sorry. Uh, four ways you can help pollination, five ways, key ways to help pollination, six simple ways you can help save bees, seven easy ways you can help bees, uh, eight ways you can help save bees. Uh, at very least time consuming, here's 10 ways to protect pollinators, 12 ways to protect pollinators, maybe even overwhelming, 20 simple gardening tips, 25 easy do-it-yourself ways to help save the bees, and in fact they may even be misguided, hear from a wiki how to do anything in their save to, uh, how to save the bees. Number seven tip is leave beehives alone when you find them, don't go disturbing the bees or taking their honey or honeycomb, especially when they're hornets. This is a hornet nest. And hornets, as you can see, actually eat bees. So if there's a crisis, is there time to educate the public? We've been, remember this recommendation from 2006, we need to educate the public. We've not done a very good job. How much progress have we made? And do we have the time to put our efforts in there? I, one suggestion is insect declines and extinctions, as you heard, are often due to what humans do without even realizing what they're doing. Benign ignorance may be the greatest obstacle to surviving the insect apocalypse. Could be one way to help people help pollinators and suggest that they stop doing things that aren't necessarily worth the time and expense of doing anyway. Call this not an action plan, but an inaction plan. It may be easier to stop doing something. Stop weeding your uh, suburban lawn. Uh, stop mowing it, for that matter. Stop growing lawns. Uh, 40 million acres is the biggest cr agricultural crop we produce in the US. If you combine row crops, tree crops, all together, um, they, they are less than all the acres of, of lawn. Um, uh, don't use uh, uh, bug zappers. They're not targeting the targets. Uh, I just saw someone look at it. Watch. Um, and they're killing thousands of potential pollinators, including moths, which, guess what, are attracted to lights. Uh, Neonicotinoid pretreatment, prophylactic use of systemic pesticide when you don't even know you have a pest problem, where at least two studies indicate that you're, uh, there's no commercial benefit or economic benefit, don't use them. So the concept of not doing anything that's harmful is venerable. It's the guiding ethical principle of medicine, first do no harm. Maybe it could work as well in pollinator health. And ideally, insect apocalyptic fiction will remain fiction. Uh, 
And if you're interested, see Maya Lund, a 2017 History of Bees book, a pre- and post-apocalyptic novel that is about colony collapse disorder. Uh, and I guess the most appropriate review would be one, the inevitable, one can easily understand the buzz. And thank you. <laughs>